Hello, everyone. I'm Nancy Molenda, Vice President of Communications for the Aluminum Extruders Council. Welcome to this latest edition in our Aluminum Extrusion Tech Series webinars. A little bit about us. Uh, AEC is an international trade association dedicated to providing information and education about aluminum extrusion and its processes. Rio Tinto is a worldwide metals and mining corporation and a global leader in aluminum. Rio Tinto is an active member of the Aluminum Extruders Council with volunteers involved in many aspects of AEC's activities, including this webinar. Today's webinar is Metal Flow Fundamentals, presented by Jerome Foreman of Rio Tinto. Jerome is Technical Director of Global Customer Support and Product Development for the Aluminum Metal Group of Rio Tinto. Since joining Rio Tinto in 2000, which was formerly Alcan, Jerome applies his technical expertise to support and provide solutions in the fields of aluminum products metallurgy tailored to the transportation, architectural, and consumer durables markets. He serves on various committees at ASTM, AMA, the Aluminum Extruders Council, and is the chairman of the Technical Committee on Product Standards at the Aluminum Association. Jerome is also the Vice Chairman of the International Aluminum Extrusion Technology Seminar, otherwise known as the ET Seminar, coming up in 2020. He is a frequent presenter at the industry conferences and is a contributing editor for the international magazine Light Metal Age with his Aluminum Extrusion Defects series. For those of you interested in receiving continuing education credits, this course has been registered with the American Institute of Architects for continuing professional education. Credits earned on completion of this course will be reported to AIA CES for AIA members. For anyone else who wishes to receive a certificate of completion, please contact us at mail at AEC.org and we will email it to you. This webinar will cover the fundamentals of aluminum metal flow through the container and the die, allowing a comprehensive understanding of the challenges in ensuring prescribed quality and part performance. Particular attention will be paid to welds, both billet to billet and in the formation of hollow shapes, and to the challenges of wider profiles. Jerome will also review the process, or sorry, the press practices that can be the root causes of potential defects and how they are managed for various extrusion applications. By the end of this presentation, attendees will be able to explain the extrusion process as it relates to loading a billet into the press and forcing it through a small opening at extreme pressure, assess problems and challenges that may affect quality and part performance, discuss press practices and consider the management of potential defects for various extrusion applications, and analyze metal flow as it relates to extrusion and design. Before we begin, I have some reminders. All computer audio and telephone lines are muted, so if you have a question during the webinar, please select Q&A or chat from the toolbar. Type your question in the dialog box and our presenter will address your question at the end of the presentation. We are recording this presentation and will send a link once it is posted. Following our webinar, we will send you an email with a link to a survey about to take today's presentation. We ask that you take a moment to answer the brief survey. We value your opinions and feedback. Now it brings me great pleasure to turn our pre presentation over to our speaker for today's webinar, Jerome Foreman. Jerome? Yes, thank you, Nancy, for the great introduction. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, all right, so basically for the next, uh, 45 minutes or so, we are going to go through uh, quite a few things, but uh, first of all, the fundamental, as well as the practical aspects of uh, metal flow, uh, starting with uh, the loading of the billet, the upset, the air entrapment issues that can encounter extruders. Uh, we'll look at the forces uh, that are applied in the, in the press, and then we'll look more specifically at some uh, very specific aspect of the extrusion uh, the extrusion, which is which are the transverse welds as well as the coring. So first, uh, I always like to start this presentation by a quick uh, safety share. Uh, don't worry about all the numbers uh, that you can see here on the on the screen here. 
But this is just a quick illustration that, you know, although the, the oil pressure in the hydraulic system of the press on the top left there is about, you know, 3,000 to about 3,500 PSI in general, uh, the pressure available on the dummy block is actually much higher than this. And that's very important. So the hydraulic pressure uh, times the surface area of the main cylinder, as well as the side rams, that equal to the pressure on the billet face on the front of the die, and that is a huge number. We're talking roughly about 100,000 pounds per square inch. So this is a, a tremendous amount of pressure, which, uh, you know, you can see here, a, a picture always worth a thousand words, right? But uh, just to simply say here that uh, care has to be taken when looking up the tunnel of the press, okay? This is something that uh, is absolutely uh, a big no-no. It can never be done like this. It's extremely, extremely dangerous. And simply because, you know, metal flow is a dynamic thing. So with very high risk, if not uh, properly handled. So tooling failure, like you can see on the, on the pictures, uh, is not an option, it's a reality. It does happen. So <clears throat> this gentleman on the top right here looking at the press, this is something that <clears throat> is obviously absolutely not recommended. Now, overall, extruders uh, are getting better uh, by using uh, camera systems. Uh, but again, a reminder is always uh, worth it. Okay, so the, the first step in extruding a, a billet here is well, well, the loading and the upsetting uh, of the billet inside the container. So, you know, although the, the objective is to optimize what we call the contact efficiency, and the contact efficiency is really emptying the container as often as possible, um, it is fundamental to completely remove the air that is entrapped inside the container. Um, and that's what we're going to see uh, right after here. So really, once the uh, dummy block actually starts to upset the, the billet, it is necessary to remove up to several liters or a couple of gallons, perhaps, of air that could be entrapped inside the container. And if this is not done properly, well, a very common defect called blisters would uh, occur. So as you can see here, um, clearly, I would say naturally, on a, on a, if you look at the top uh, picture here, the front loading press, uh, naturally, it, it is better to support the billet uh, in the center of the container before upsetting it, okay? But this can only be done by loading the billet between the die and the container, okay? So modern presses, that's what they do today. But however, most presses cannot do this. And the, the results is what you see on the, on the bottom picture here is a, an upset of the billet uh, with a potential buckling of the billet uh, with an uneven air and billet skin distribution. You can see those white pockets there on the, on the, on the, you know, in the, on the bottom pictures. That's something that uh, is common. It has to be well understood and properly managed to avoid any kind of uh, issue down the road. So when we look at uh, eliminating uh, air, um, those, uh, the, the air really can come from different area. It can come from the back end of the push, the transverse well, and all the air entrapments that are generated due to a poor uh, upset uh, or burp cycle uh, on the press. Uh, just so if it's not removed, you can see those pictures. Uh, most of you know, obviously, what I'm talking here about. But you know, you have some back end blisters. Um, and you can see on the top right those pictures. Obviously, a little bit of surface extrusion that shows those little tiny bubbles of air uh, on the surface. And the picture on the bottom right here, actually, in the middle, you can see that little air bubble and trap. And that is actually uh, on the interface between the. Uh, what we will see a little bit later in the presentation, the transverse weld, uh, that's the interface between the new billet and the remaining metal inside the die, okay? So we'll cover this uh, in a few seconds here. So the ideal upset, uh, this is uh, always quite, uh, quite interesting. 
And so as you can see on this little simulation here, um, what's the ideal upset really? It's really when you upset from the die end back to the dummy block. Okay, so from the die end on the left back to the dummy block. So basically there's no air entrapment. That's the perfect uh, case scenario. As you can see here, everything is extruded very nicely, no problem, okay? So um, now typically in the process, there is no burp cycle on the first billet. Now this is common practice, but every consecutive billet will have a burp cycle. So obviously, uh, you know, calculating the burp pressure versus the billet length and the actual uh, liner diameter inside the container is a very important to make sure that all the air is fully removed. So here we go. Um, so what you see here, this little graph, you can follow it and you, you will understand very clearly what I'm about to, to, to say here. But um, you know, sometimes um, when we want to study the upset, it, it's quite difficult, okay? And uh, particularly upsetting a billet and then pushing it out is just pointless. If you don't do this uh, by knowing exactly how much pressure, how much air needs to be removed, there is, uh, there is no real point of, of, of doing it, you know, if I, if I can say it very blankly like this. Um, and that is simply because the bidet undergoes so much deformation during the pushing out. Um, there was a, a great uh, paper that was published uh, at ET in 20, 2004 that explained this process very, very well. Now, the, the graph that you have here on the screen illustrates that the upset always starts near the center of the bidet. Okay? And even with a positive taper, again, a positive taper, that's when the front of the billet is hotter than the back of the billet. Okay, that's the good way to extrude. Okay, we want to have the, the front of the billet touching the die uh, hotter than the back of the billet. We call this positive taper. Okay, so if we follow the process here step by step, um, once the contact has been made between the billet and the container, then the upset actually progresses toward the stem because of the resistance offered by the center of the bit. And I will cover this in the coring presentation. And once the upset is near uh, completion uh, at the stem, then the upset progress toward the die. So it starts from the back and it progresses toward the front. And that's what you can see in this simulation here. Here we goes. And so here comes the billet being loaded here. And the data basically suggests, uh, that's exactly what the data suggests, you know, for upsetting a uniform billet or positive billet taper, okay? So the air pocket here end up at the back end, uh, at the back end of the billet. You can see it's progressing. And then here it goes. Perhaps you see it now. You can see some little air uh, bubble here that are being pushed toward the extrusion. Now, the billet uh, discard, or yeah, billet discard, or the butt to call it, okay, uh, often shows the, the, the presence of air. It's always very good to look inside the, uh, the billet bin to, to, look at the, um, to look at those butts and see if there is air into it or not, you know. So it's a, a very good indication of the upsetting phase and how, how efficient the, the process is. Uh, now, it's almost inevitable to, uh, to have uh, blisters, okay, and it will occur at some point in the process. Um, it's better to have it like we see it on those pictures, you know, because this is waste material, so that's totally fine. Uh, so it has to be either, you know, in the butt, either remain inside the die that will be, that metal will be pushed right at the beginning of the, of the following billet. And in, uh, in any instance, uh, that air entrapment or those air entrapment will be removed. Now, the air uh, can be trapped also uh, at the billet surface, okay? Uh, that's coming from uh, what perhaps damage on the, on, the, on the delivery, on the loading of the billet in the press, uh, or of course, any kind of buckling, you know, uh, that could occur on the billet during the upsetting phase. Um, 
very true if you are running long billets, uh, let's say you know, about 50 inches or so, right? Uh, you know, when that billet is put under pressure uh, and it starts filling the, uh, filling the, the liner inside the container, then of course uh, buckling can occur and then air entrapment can be uh, can be generated obviously those pictures that you this picture that you see here those billets were uh, were uh, removed from inside the container okay so just for the purpose of the uh, of the picture here you can see that there was some air entrapment somewhere in the middle of the billet and uh, that air being pushed under so much pressure inside the container that air turns extremely hot to the point that it's actually hot enough to melt uh, aluminum and in some cases to even melt steel. Now, by looking at this picture here, um, you, I'm sure you, you see what I'm going to say here. This is a two-piece billet um, that has been sheared. And so the two-piece billets uh, naturally are likely to generate air entrapment, okay, especially with a poor log shearing. So um, two-piece billets are, are not recommended for any kind of structural application. And for anything else, um, they can be used, but they have to be uh, properly handled. So proper shearing, if that's the process that is used to cut the, the, the log into little pieces of billet like we see here. Um, and also the cutting uh, angularity is also to be considered here. So if a shear, um, I would say, you know, cannot cut square short pieces, it cannot supply any two-piece billet, okay? Um, and the, the, the reference I typically refer is like, you know, less than half a degree per four inches. So less than half a degree per four inches. No more than that, okay? So, um, and that's a very good rule actually for systems such as a hot saw, uh, to make sure that the angularity is correct to prevent uh, any kind of air entrapment and to have a good um, a good metal flow, a good upsetting phase. Now, this is a, a much better example of actually a, a modern uh, log shear, uh, which you can clearly see that the result is far better than what they used to be. Okay, uh, so th they're still can produce some blisters with two-piece bennet, that's for sure. Uh, but definitely the corner, as you can see, is much more square than, uh, than the picture that you've seen uh, before. So now, even hot saws uh, with their perfect square cuts can lead to blisters. When one of the pieces tip during the loading, especially in a front loading, uh, front loading press, uh, or of course, if the front piece is, uh, is too short, okay? So that's always a common practice that uh, extruders follow very, very carefully. Now, uh, sometimes uh, with inadequate burp pressure, there is a, a gap that uh, you can see this liner bore here the, where the arrow points out, you can see a gap between the liner face and, uh, and the billet. So uh, when this gap remains during the extrusion at the die end, uh, of the container, uh, then clearly you can have some air entrapment and obviously some blisters that can come out. Now, I would say in the in the case of that specific picture, okay, this is not necessarily a disaster, okay, as this part of the billet does not always flow through the die into the profile, except with wide profiles. So profiles that are very wide. Um, if, if the billet would be eight inches, you know, and the profile is eight inches, let's just say, uh, then of course there is a risk of having that air flowing toward the, toward the extrusion. So in, in this case, what can be done is a, a double burp cycle, you know, can help uh, solving this kind of issues. Um, we also see those kind of problem a little bit more often with long billets, so anything longer than 50 inches or with a large clearance, you know, between the billet uh, and the container, uh, those scenarios can make things uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit worse. So now let's see what happened with a, a negative billet uh, taper. Okay, so negative billet taper. The front of the billet is cold, 
and the back of the billet is hot. That's something that we don't want, all right? So here comes the, the upsetting phase, and you will see on the front there, after the verb, there's still this little blue area, right? And here comes the air bubble that could start fall, flowing inside the profile and generate uh, blisters throughout the entire extrusion length. So what extruder do, they control the uh, bedded temperature um, and um, there's different ways, but for instance, uh, there's a possibility in some cases to actually rotate the bedded coming out of the furnace uh, to make sure that the front end against the die is uh, hot or hot, hotter than the back. Now, this is the second simulation here that hopefully it's playing at this point. Um, and what you see here, this is the butt shearing and burp that can introduce air to the transverse well. So uh, at some point you're going to see as soon as the, the billet open, or the, the container open, um, you will see the billet face uh, that is not very smooth in this illustration, okay? And that obviously will generate uh, some air entrapment. So this is the case actually with, uh, I would say, you know, poor shear uh, sharpness or with some sticky alloys, like some 3000 or 1000 series alloy. The extruders have to be very careful with those. Um, and it can also happen, you know, sometimes during uh, the burp cycle, the, the new billet and the die kind of stick together, uh, causing a, a plugging out. Okay, plugging out is when you have uh, some metal inside the die that actually pulled away during that process. So that will create a little bit of void uh, in the die, and consequently you could have this air entrapment that uh, goes into the extrusion. So this is the case actually of uh, air entrapment. Uh, at the transverse weld interface. So we can keep that in mind when I will start talking about uh, the transverse weld. So now, just quickly in summary here about the upset and uh, flow, just keep in mind that there is about roughly 10% of air to be removed between the bed and the liner, okay? So 10%, so that's, uh, that's quite a bit. The uh, process of upsetting and burping the bed is actually uh, very important to avoid uh, those kind of problems. So also keep in mind that the upset starts in the center of the billet, then move back toward the dummy block, and finally toward the die, okay? <clears throat> and so the air trap here at the, at the die end stays in the dead zone or enter wide profile, okay? That, that's right. Um, so any kind of air entrapment that stays kind of close to the die here, um, well, can simply uh, either be locked there or be released, especially in the case of white profiles. Okay. Um, now, quite often we ask, you know, about, um, oh, when, Extruders have issues with blisters. Uh, one of the first questions, I guess, that is asked is, well, where are, you know, what, what's the trend in terms of blisters appearance, right? Are they more on the front, uh, the middle, the back, or something like this? So, look, typically, <clears throat> when the, billet, uh, the blisters are located uh, on, the, on the front of the extrusion, uh, it's good to look for any kind of poor uh, butt sharing, you know, uh, or residual air from the end of the push, which basically roll inside the die, okay? All this will end up being pushed first, so blisters will show up on the beginning or the front end of the extrusion. And also, as we discussed, it's also the case of a negative taper, when the front of the billet is colder than the back. That's typical root causes, let's say, to have blisters on the front. Now, when they're on the back of the extrusion, uh, again, 
it's good to look at the billet conditions, right? Any kind of dents uh, on, the, on the surface. Uh, issues related with the dummy block uh, functionality. As you know, the dummy block, uh, this big piece of steel, uh, are supposed to contract, okay? Or retract. And uh, so that clearly can be a problem uh, during the verb cycle. Uh, if the dummy block uh, can contract on its own, the air can be removed and will end up staying on the back end and consequently ex being, extrude, uh, being extruded uh, as, the, as the metal come out uh, of the die. And uh, also blisters in the back here, uh, anything related to the long bed at more than 50 inches, again, definitively, uh, definitively can be a problem. And finally, if there is an insuffic insufficient uh, upset uh, that is conducted, uh, that definitively will impact the formation of blisters. Now, if the blisters are random, let's say, they come up at some you know, given point, uh, always good to look uh, if a two-piece billet was used or not, okay? So, now, uh, I'd like to talk on the second piece of the presentation here uh, about the basic uh, forces that occur during the extrusion uh, and the effect on the metal flow. So, if you look at this um, picture here, let's consider what the pressure is inside uh, the billet. Okay, so basically that's the red area that you see here. And you can see that, um, you know, the darker red area on the right, that illustrates that uh, much, the pressure is much, or the forces are much higher in the back toward the dummy block than in the front, where the extrusion comes out here in blue. So the pressure, the forces, definitely higher toward the dummy block than on the front. Now, this is an old uh, you know, paper recording uh, illustration, but it's always good anyway. Uh, and basically what you reflect here is the principle about the uh, pressure distribution on the stem. That's the green line that you see. You can see, if you look carefully um, on the left side of the green area, you see it goes up and down. That's the illustration of the burp cycle, okay, or the upset and the burp. Uh, and of course, after when it spikes to the top, that's the breakthrough uh, from you know from high to low, basically. Um, and so, as you can see in, in black here, black line, that's the uh, die phase pressure, and the die phase pressure remains relatively constant during the entire push. Okay, so it's not because there is a whole lot of pressure uh, at the beginning of the push toward the dummy block that the die phase pressure change. Actually, it's quite, quite, quite uh, consistent. Now, let's have a, a quick look here uh, at the container friction aspect. The container friction on the top picture, uh, I'm talking about, uh, uh, talking about the red arrows that you can see here. That's the container friction, okay? And they create a ra radial uh, pressure distribution across the die. Okay, now at the end of the push, so the, the picture on the bottom here, the end of the push, the, the, the container friction is small and therefore the, the difference in forces um, between the, the center of the billet and the outside uh, of, the, of the net of the die is much more reduced at that point. So that means that the, the, the pressures, you know, on the thongs, um, and the center of the die is actually marginally higher at the start of the push, and that the difference in the bearing length actually is no longer required to really balance the flow, okay? So this is always a trade-off between, uh, you know, proper design uh, of, the, of the die, specifically the bearing, uh, so the, the, the part of the die that really touches the metal, uh, that really give the shape and give the tolerances, most especially, uh, and uh, so it, there was always this trade-off between uh, having to manage clearly um, the, the, the profile geometry, let's say, between the beginning of the push and the end of the push. Okay, and it's always always a challenge. That's why there is uh, tolerances for aluminum extrusion. Now, uh, in the case of large profiles, so those are a little bit more problematic. Okay, and that's simply because the Again, because of the container friction, basically, and the the flow, uh, the metal flow is actually faster uh, 
in the center of the container. So now this effect uh, reduces during the push and toward the end of the bid end. The flow simply balances out. But as illustrated here, you can see sometimes some uh, effect on the shape, such as you know webbiness and differences in tolerances. So the, the the metal flow is something that extruders are really really um, pay a lot of attention to in the profile design, in the tolerances that are applied, and of course the alloy selections uh, depending on the complexity uh, of the profile. That's a few examples here of uh, typical wide profiles uh, and the effect uh, that the container friction has on the shape. Um, you, know, you can see a typical uh, you know, shop front, louver, uh, sliding door here, a very common uh, building and construction type profile in this case. And so, uh, again, the longer the bit, the worse is the front to back variation. The worse, the, 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 the more variability uh, take place um, and again this is due to the reduction in the container friction that occur from the front toward the center toward the back of the extrusion okay so uh, how do we how do we control this how do extruder control this effect uh, and by, by the way this is mother nature right? it's not something that uh, someone is doing bad no it's just mother nature of the extrusion business and dealing with high pressures and of course temperatures so how do we control this um, well, first, it's to really watch for profile that are basically are more than 80% of the circle size, okay? Um, when profiles become too wider, too wide, uh, then, uh, then clearly you can introduce uh, more variability as illustrated on this slide. Um, another aspect is to add actually a large uh, uh, baffling ring uh, on, the, on the front of the die, about two inches, that helps also stabilize things. And uh, better taper heating, okay? So again, trying to have the front of the bedet against the die hot and folder toward the dummy block uh, definitely can uh, help reducing this kind of variability. Now, of course, I'm not mentioning here anything about uh, tooling or die and dummy block temperatures, um, but the extrusion business is all about temperature. And uh, one, of, one of the key uh, temperature aspects to consider is the preheating, the proper preheating of the die and the entire tooling that surround uh, the die itself. So now I'd like to talk a minute about the transverse weld. All right, so this little illustration here actually is quite good for either uh, transverse weld or coring, okay? Um, so let's just keep in mind, you know, when talking about metal flow, so transverse weld, the coring, all of that, that nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed, absolutely. So whatever happened inside that container is not going to disappear, okay? It will come out, uh, either in the extrusion or stay inside the, the, the container. Um, and that's something that is well understood today and has to be properly managed. So first, if you look at this uh, picture here, you can see a, a typical hollow extrusion, let's say, not a good one. Uh, the first one, the first uh, weld that I want to highlight is the what we call the longitudinal weld, okay? Uh, for any hollow extrusion having uh, being extrude, extruded with a, a direct uh, direct press, uh, you will have those longitudinal welds as highlighted in green here. This is just part of the DNA of a hollow profile. The second type of weld that we see here in blue, that's what we call the transverse weld, okay? And the one that are a little bit uh, darker here with more almost let's say more junk in it <clears throat> that's what we will consider the coring so i'm going to explain now <clears throat> what uh, what those are all about so uh, look transverse weld here any continuous extrusion has transverse weld okay so except the first billet on a new die that is loaded inside the press any consecutive billet will have transverse weld 
because the transverse weld is simply the the junction between the metal left inside the die and the front of the new bed. So when those two metal gets together, they create uh, they create what's called a transverse weld when it's extruded. The problem with the transverse weld is that um, it's, it's an area that is heavily oxidized, okay? And even if um, there's been a, a freshly sheared, you know, or hot saw uh, billet coming up here, uh, one of the beauty of aluminum, it, it's, uh, uh, it, it, it also protects itself, so it creates an aluminum oxide layer extremely quickly uh, and so regardless of uh, whatever is done process wise there will be this uh, physical uh, oxide layer between uh, again between the die on the you see on the picture on the left side there and the new bed that's coming from the container okay so uh, that's what we call the uh, transverse well now uh, two piece bed to remember the picture i showed before they behave exactly in the same fashion, okay? Because there will be a transverse weld in the middle of a two-piece bed used. So, in any regards, transverse weld is an inferior uh, metal uh, quality uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of properties uh, and in terms of anodizing process. Um, uh, look, if the profile is non-structural, typically a transverse weld uh, can be used, okay? Um, if the profile is structural, absolutely not. In terms of anodizing, um, here again, thin wall anodized profile with the transverse weld, uh, those welds tend to be revealed after the anodizing process. And you can see it's, it looks like a, an extrusion defect, pretty much almost like what you can see here on the, on the bottom picture on that slide. Uh, another example here of transverse weld, um, again, as you can see on the top left, or top right actually, uh, the joint is not very strong, okay? Uh, and not strong to handle any kind of uh, severe, as say, stretching, okay? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's what transverse weld is all about. So, um, um, again, uh, you'll see later uh, when we talk about coring, um, they can be transverse well combined with coring. Okay? Uh, I will describe this a bit later on. Uh, they almost look the same, especially on the top left picture here. But once you do uh, once a, 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 a detailed analysis, a lithographic work is done on the profile, you are actually able to differentiate a, a weld from a transverse or a weld coming from the back end of the process. Okay, let's, here it goes. That simulation is playing uh, probably now. And what you can see here is the formation of the transverse weld. Okay, that's a simple, uh, uh, call it hollow or solid shape, okay? Um, in blue, by the way, the light blue, this is the die. In green, that's the ring. Uh, and then in, in red or purple here, that's what we would call the bolster. Right? So the, the piece of steel that is going to support the die. And so uh, that's, uh, that's simply, um, simply what, uh, what happened here in the process. So now, uh, the transverse weld length depends actually on the ratio of volume of metal inside the pocket or the port of the die. So it's the, the, the ratio of, uh, again, the ratio of the volume of metal inside the die, let's say, uh, over the cross section area of the profile. Okay, uh, and so this uh, schematic here shows how different the longitudinal weld, either position or length, as a matter of fact, can vary depending on the volume of metal that is inside, let's call the, the die, but the tooling itself, okay? So um, with that, um, there are ways to actually uh, ways to actually calculate or estimate quite well uh, the transverse weld position and length. So an approximate uh, calculation for transverse weld, the, the scrap length, is related, again, to the volume of metal in the port, okay, which is pushed out by the bed, okay, over the profile 
uh, cross-section area. And we also apply here a 1.5 uh, coefficient of factor, basically to account uh, in some respect for the, the fact that the metal does not come out the die in one big lump uh, part, okay? So it's elongated. And this 1.5 didn't come up just as a, as a number out of the blue. It was clearly calculated and demonstrated. So now, um, Another approach here, uh, other than just calculating the transverse wet length by the volume of metal, you also can do it uh, with the weight uh, of metal in the port, okay? Um, and so that simply can be done uh, by weighting the die empty and the die full, and same thing, uh, dividing that, uh, that weight by the profile weight, in the pound per foot, for example, uh, multiply by 1.5, and that will also provide the estimated scrap length in feet or meters or whatever you want to use as a unit, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. It's not super complicated. Um, it can be done on each and every die, and it's, uh, it's a very good information to know uh, to properly cut uh, the front-end scrap especially for structural application, obviously, but also for anodized quality products. Now, what you see here on the screen, um, the drawing in the middle, this is a, a, a drawing of a die. Uh, the solid shape that you see in the middle is actually a, is actually a profile, obviously, but you can see uh, there's uh, four longitudinal weld area here, each of the colors. Um, and all, that profile was actually a, a bumper beam uh, for, for a car. Um, and so this is a summary of the ET2008 work that was conducted to, to establish those formulas. And so uh, the profile here that was tested, um, what you can see on a, on a, let me go to the next slide, I think it's better, yes. Um, this is two microstructures that were taken at, um, Five feet from the from the from the from the beginning of the push, and so what you can see here is quite interesting because between the ports D and A, you can see the longitudinal weld. Same thing between C and B, but uh, on the bottom right picture, you actually can see that the transverse weld has starting to show. Now, where those yellow arrows are. Okay, those kind of a uh, oval shape here. This is actually the new material. This is the new billet that is pushing away the material from the die. Okay, that's what we call the transverse valley. It looks like a cone, basically. Okay? Um, and so, so you see the difference here. We cut the sample. This is the same sample, by the way. But we look between D and A, there is no transverse weld. And however, in the port between C and B, the transverse weld is already showing up here. All this to say that uh, the transverse weld has to be uh, calculated, really. Okay? Uh, this is 20 feet. In that exercise, that profile, and we did many different profiles in this case, uh, but at 20 feet, that's quite a bit of metal here, actually. Uh, finally, on all ports, the transverse weld was fully removed. That means that all the metal from the previous billet that was inside the die was finally pushed away, and the new metal was being, or the new billet was finally being extruded. So, a lot of words here. Don't worry about all of this. Um, so, um, you can read this at your, at your leisure. But uh, look, transverse weld is a weak joint, okay? Not just for not just for the regular process, but also for two pieces of bed. So keep that in mind. Uh, again, the scrap length is approximately 1.5 times the port volume over the profile cross section area. Okay, and with non-symmetric uh, profile, it can be much more. Okay, so we always recommend, um, although by doing the kind of the quick math here, uh, especially for structural profile is to cut samples, to etch them properly, uh, and to really look for the start of the uh, transverse weld. Uh, 
So nothing can replace a good sampling for sure. Now, Bennett flow, keep going on this, and uh, we're going to talk now about the core ring. So, uh, although the, you know, the transverse swell is the beginning of the push, okay, the core ring is what occurs at the back end of the push, right? As simple as that. Uh, what you see here, those two um, schematic here, uh, illustrate the metal flow. Um, and um, there are two types, right? I mean, two types. We call type one flow on the top here. This is basically the metal that would tend to flow from the front, okay? So, and when we talk about coring, perhaps I should mention this right away, but what is coring? The coring is actually the billet skin that is not the best, not the, the, the you know, not the best metal, let's say, in, in the billet. Okay, I won't go into all the detail here, but um, it's very well known that the billet skin uh, has to be removed for various reasons. So it got to be taken care of. Now, the type two, this is absolutely inevitable in direct hot extrusion, okay? The billet turns itself like inside out and eventually near the back of the push, the skin enters the center of the profile. I show you an illustration, a simulation right after, but here, this is a study that was done quite a while ago. Um, and the pictures illustrate is basically metal that was removed from the die. Okay. So uh, for the, the, the extruders among you, you will realize that the, on each of those pictures, the, the part that is on the right side of it, that's the profile coming out. And the big block of aluminum here in the middle, that's the metal, the bennet on the left kind of. And of course, the metal that is inside the die. Okay, so um, that's a work of 1992, as a matter of fact. And let's start with type one flow. You see, over that zone here in green, those lines. You know, this is the kind of thing that uh, have that has to be controlled. Okay, this is something. It's part of the bitted skin that could start flowing from the front during the push or simply be released at any given point in the profile. That's a problem. That's the kind of thing that can generate, uh, of course, blisters, as I mentioned before, but most, most specifically, uh, inclusions, uh, streaks, you know, uh, those kind of things that uh, are not acceptable. And in red here, the type two flow, that's the coring. So as the bit of uh, prog or the push progresses, okay, you can see this, uh, Bennett skin that accumulate toward the back end and uh, start rolling toward the center of the extrusion. That's another picture here, a little bit more realistic perhaps. Uh, again, on the right, same thing. Um, the, where the red arrow is, that's the profile right there. And uh, the right picture, you can see all those, looks like a bark of a tree, right? Uh, all those lines illustrate, again, the, uh, the, the, the bedded skin uh, rolling inside out uh, toward the center of the extrusion. So when you look now at a cross section of an extrusion in the middle here, those two pictures, uh, those are thick, solid, solid profile, obviously. But you can see that uh, right here in the center, that oval shape, uh, this is uh, very much unsound metal, uh, full of uh, nasty things. Um, and that's obvious, that's part of the process, okay? It's no, no big deal, but that's the kind of thing, kind of a length that has to be removed and obviously not used for any kind of, uh, any kind of application. Now, looking at, uh, looking at the uh, simulation here, this is a, a good one in place. So you can follow this on your own. Uh, you've seen those now quite a bit, but you will see that uh, the accumulation of the bedded skin uh, facing the dummy block, and then as the extrusion progress near the die, uh, the coring starts working. So the shear takes place, the butt is removed, but as you can see, there is still some coring trapped inside the die, okay? So the new bullet gets loaded, upset it, burped, and start pushing. And of course, what you will see then 
is that in the front end of the extrusion, the beginning could be the remaining coring, followed right away by the transverse well. Okay? Hence the mix that sometimes people can get confused with, especially on the beginning of the push. The end of the push is only potentially coring. Okay, uh, now th this graph uh, was built here with many, many uh, data and profile and different geometry here. And really uh, what it illustrates is actually the effect of the, um, uh, to say the, the butt uh, percentage, okay, over various billet diameters, 11, 9, and 7 inch, okay, over the billet length, all right? So in a nutshell here, uh, basically 14% seems to be the magic number here. That is the number that guarantee freedom of coring, okay? But of course it depends on the application. So at 14% of the remaining billet length, that's when the coring, the, basically the billet skin, starts flowing toward the center uh, of the extrusion passing through the die, okay? So extruders have various uh, technique here. Uh, to, to eliminate the scoring, it can be left in the butt, that's the most common area. Uh, it can be part of a little bit inside the die uh, that would be pushed on the front and, and be scrapped as well. Uh, so the different areas like this. Now, 14% is a, uh, it's a conservative number. It's a good number for structural application. Uh, for anything else, less structural, um, there's ways, you know, around 12%, I would say, that seem to be a pretty, uh, a pretty accurate number. So uh, again here, the scrap percentage uh, correlates with the effective skin thickness. Now the, what I call the effective skin thickness here is the, um, the, the bedded skin, so the quality of the bedded, that depends on the casting technology obviously, plus the skull from the previous bed, and the skull, I didn't mention this yet, uh, but the skull is basically the aluminum oxide uh, accumulation that tend to stick inside the liner of the container, okay? So all this sticking into account um, is a way, you know, to, to fully understand that and fully manage, of course, that, uh, that, uh, that coring here. Uh, cold dummy block, always better to delay that coring, so to basically have that bedded skin stick to the dummy block rather than just being loose, okay? Um, what else, the, and the well, I, I mentioned, uh, uh, same thing on temperature aspect, uh, the temperature of the container, um, highly recommended, the container should be about, you know, 50 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, cooler than the bedded, okay? So container, cooler than the bedded, same thing, that will allow the, the aluminum skin to stick on the container and, uh, and simply control the, uh, its flow through the extrusion. Okay, I'm gonna put those three right here on the screen. Um, so now, here we see the, 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 the coring, or the transverse well, you know, but look at the, the coring specifically here. Uh, you know, can be either in the front or obviously the back, okay? But naturally, the, the, the position of the coring actually will depend on the type of die. So the one that is on top here, that's a no, what I call normal hollow, okay? So a normal hollow is a, well, you know, a typical medium-sized hollow with, a, an, I would say, an even distribution, you know, of the, the front and the, and the back end, okay? So you can see a little bit of trend, right, a little bit of coring on the front, followed by the transverse weld in red, all right? And then on the back, just the coring. The one in the middle here, this is a large hollow. So a large hollow die is where you have a die volume that is so large that the coring actually does not even exit the die. It's thick inside the die. So the die itself, the feeder ring on the front, and so forth. Now, the result of that kind of uh, large hollow uh, uh, setup is that there is no back-end coring in the extrusion, okay? It's entirely inside, stuck inside the die, in the butt, of course, 
but the coring will show up just on the front, then the back end, uh, then the transverse rock, but nothing on the back end of the extrusion, right? And of course, the other way around completely, the bottom one, this is for solid profile with a pocket die. So basically, there is almost no volume of, let's call it, dead metal, you know, that's stick inside the die. Uh, it's just flat out. And so in this case, the uh, coring on the front is extremely thin, and most of the coring will come out at the end of the push, right? And the transverse rod in those cases is usually very, very thin. So you can see here that, again, that's why there are formulas that uh, can be uh, easily used to estimate as much as possible the length, the position of either the transverse wall or the coring for each and every die setup because it will change each and every time. And finally, just a couple of examples here. Uh, the coring and transverse weld. In this case, you recognize this uh, simple hollow tube extrusion, okay, uh, which is called work. And you can see some uh, crack in the metal there. So after conducting the investigation, the red arrow is pointing out at the longitudinal weld. That's normal. It's part of the process, okay? But the green arrows are, are actually highlighting the presence of a transverse weld, okay? It's a good weld. It's not bad, right? But when this uh, profile was put under a lot of stress, cold work stress, that longitudinal weld actually failed and uh, resulted in a cracking of the sample on the, the profile. That's a typical uh, square building, building and construction part, uh, you know, cut, painted, the whole thing, and someone tried to put a, a screw in the screw port there. Um, I don't think the screw was too big, but anyway, as you can see, the profile cracked. We got the sample, and you see, you see the top uh, right pictures here. Again, you will see right in the middle the longitudinal weld, Okay, that's normal, it's well positioned, but there was a little bit less of coring in this case. And the coring is, um, if you follow that break, you can see it kind of turned, uh, you see uh, it kind of turned to the right here on the, on the top of the picture, and that's, uh, that was maybe a foot or two of uh, contaminated metal part of the extrusion that put under stress ended up uh, failing. So with that, uh, we conclude this uh, presentation. So again, we talked about the, specifically to the uh, upsetting phase of the billet uh, and burping that follow right, the, right after the loading of the, loading of the press. Uh, very important, of course, to control air entrapment and the blisters. We look at the forces that manage the, the metal flow uh, inside the container and how that billet uh, again, the piece of metal flow through the die, and consequently, uh, the again, the, the natural uh, consequence uh, that come with the extrusion process of having to manage the transverse weld, as well as the uh, coring, so front end and back end scrap of the extrusion, which are well understood by the extruder, properly cut um, to prevent any kind of uh, any kind of issue down the road and provide the, the best. Uh, metal quality possible. With this, I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I think Nancy has a few words. Thanks, Jerome. Um, we do have time for like one or two questions. So as a reminder, if you have a question, select Q&A from the toolbar and type your question in the dialog box. We do have a couple of questions that I want to go through. Um, one of the questions is, Jerome, how deep below the extrusion surface might blisters occur? Well, yes, good questions. Um, typically, uh, they can. It all depends. There is no. There is no answer to this. I would say that's the that's the, the easiest answer. Uh, they can occur in anywhere in the profile. Okay. Now, uh, for sure, if it's a thin profile, uh, let's say we're talking a thin wall profile, a typical building and construction type thing, uh, those blisters are going to be. Uh, visual, they will show up on the surface, you know, you will see that little bubble clearly. If it's a thicker profile, uh, blisters can be in the middle there, and they will not be vi visible, okay, and it will not be a problem. Um, it's not a structural problem, honestly, 
uh, it could become an issue, of course, if it's a fake profile that, for instance, is, is machined, okay? And then the machining tool at some point will end up cutting into the blisters, then obviously you get into a, another problem here. Uh, but yeah, so again, they're either visible or non-visible, and it really depends on the, uh, on the metal thickness of the profile. Okay, great. Um, well, it's 2 o'clock, and unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for uh, questions. Um, thank you, Jerome, for a great presentation and sharing this information with us. Uh, and thanks to Rio Tinto and to all of our members for making this webinar series possible. The recording of today's webinar will be available online soon on the AEC website, and we will send you a link once it's uploaded. The evaluation survey for this webinar will be sent to you following this presentation. Please share your comments with us. Your input is very valuable and helpful in developing future webinars. Be sure to visit our website at aec.org webinars for more upcoming webinars on aluminum extrusions. And the website also has information and resources on aluminum extrusion process, design and applications, technical information, and much more. This concludes our webinar. Thank you for being with us today.